Welcome to Waiver Watch episode 3 on December 1st, 2019. We are 107waivers.com and each Sunday we look at the previous week's 107 waivers granted and pull out some of the most interesting ones and give you a little spiel on them. This week was a hot week for the FAA granting waivers. We saw a total of 52 waivers granted. This is the record that we've seen since we've been tracking only three weeks, but we've been tracking them. And it is quite a feat for the FAA to really step up their game. Maybe they were preemptively approving some for the down week that we'll see next week because of the Thanksgiving holiday. Yeah, so, those uh, end of year performance reviews, man. Got to get <laughs> gotta, those waivers cranked out. That's right. That's right. We got to get like, yeah, more golden stars in the calendar, right? So that's right. <laughs> Fifty-two. Woo. Yeah. All right. All right. So, so maybe each, hit on the types. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we got brought to brought you by. by like Sesame Street. Brought to you <laughs> by this week's waiver watch is brought to you by the following letters, and they're important ones because we're gonna go into them today. So. They're expensive as well, right. but that's right. <laughs> BVLOS or BV loss, Jakey. What or is BV that? Los. Oh, BV loss. I don't really like that. I like BV eh, loss. Me neither. But yeah, yeah. is what it is. It's like <laughs> so. Give us it's like tomato, tomato. But okay, what, what is BV loss? Exactly. Sorry, what does it stand for? <laughs> Beyond visual line of sight. So and, to define it quick, it generally means when the aircraft is flown beyond the sight, you know, visual sight unaided of the pilot not necessarily all the crew but it's flown beyond the sight of the pilot that's Mm -hmm. what bb loss is and that's the trick in this 107.31 waiver that was granted today well 31 and 33 that's right Um, yeah we'll get into it (laughs) let's get the breakdown though why don't you tell us jakey how many waivers of each were granted last week november 21st through the 27th yeah, so uh, overwhelmingly <laughs> in favor of the night waivers as usual, but they hit 50 of those this week. It's crazy. 50.107.29 daylight operations waivers. They had uh, one 107.39, that's operations over human beings. That was our, our friends at Pair Zero finally got back on the board after a week mm-hmm. off. And then the last one was the kind of the one we're going to focus on this week, a 107.31 and 107.33 waiver. It's uh, one waiver for two regulations. And uh, let's just hit on what those are quick. So 10731, that's visual line of sight aircraft operations. 107.33 is visual observer. However, this week's waiver only got two parts of 107.33, Bravo and Charlie 2. So that's kind of important. They didn't just get the whole regulation waived. They actually got a, a specific part of that regulation. Mm-hmm. waived so jumping into it um this waiver was granted to the massachusetts department of transportation aeronautics division um so this is actually this is really good that we're seeing some of these more advanced waivers get approved these are difficult to get they're probably the hardest waiver to get um but this is really good that we're starting to see people work towards this and this method behind the waiver that they got approved is actually really smart. And we'll explain some of the, the, those provisions on how they ended up getting this waiver. Um, so we'll just jump right into it. Provision eight uh, describes how the VOs must be utilized in this waiver. So you need at least one VO for this operation. And this is indi- in the, like an indication of that there's some daisy chain visual observer going to obtain this beyond visual line of sight of the RPIC. So like Jakey said earlier, not all the crew cannot see the drone at all times, you know, so the VO here, somebody will be seeing this aircraft through the entire flight, which is really important. So if you're listening on the podcast, we do have a graphic on our YouTube version and our website that we can go to. We're just going to kind of describe that right now. So theoretically, a person can see, let's say three quarters of a mile to a mile. So how do you obtain daisy chain visual observers? You work within that boundary of their or their the constraints of their vision uh during the day so whether you know you might have some haze so you might have some uh difference in distances that you can see but essentially you overlap the vision of both people both crew members so the r pick and the vo so that you're able to maintain visual line of sight of the aircraft at all times during this operation now this can extend your flight let's say in this example 2.5 nautical miles now this is a huge gain 
over three quarters of a mile that you can only do with one RPIC and one VO that's standing next to him locally. So this is a really smart way and a maybe more cost effective way, maybe not so much scalable, but a cost effective way to obtain visual, uh, beyond visual line of sight operations today without spending large sums of money with detect and avoid equipment such as radar or some sort of vision uh, sensing devices. Yeah, and yeah, we've certainly seen a lot of the technology testing for DAA, uh, detect and avoid equipment. Over the last year or two, it's starting to pick up. There's Iris with an electro-optical type of solution. There's Echodyne with a radar solution and so on. But a lot of these solutions just still need time. They still need to mature. Like you said, they're very expensive. So, so, so Daisy Chain Visual Observer Waiver is kind of a way to uh, get going with advanced operations now. And like you said, fairly inexpensively, a VO, uh, unless you're paying, I guess, somebody at your company just to stand there, uh, VO can be fairly inexpensive. So uh, so these are good uh, good waivers to get, just to, to get going with longer longer flights, further, and uh, as we'll kind of go through the rest of the provisions, uh, kind of really amp up your, your company with mature documents and processes. Right. So. And operational experience, right? You got to start somewhere. Um, you can't just go flying 300 miles across the U.S. Yeah. and think that that's going to be the first waiver that you're going to get approved by the FAA. It's not going to happen. I right. certainly will hope that the FAA will give you some credit when you have operational experience beyond the line of sight of uh, the RPIC. So these are just yep. good things to start practicing, start becoming a more advanced aviator uh, in the unmanned space. So maybe, Jacob, we should jump into a little bit more of these provisions and kind of get into, hey, what kind of things does the Department of Transportation have to jump through in order to get these approvals from the FAA? Yeah, so a lot of these provisions sort of require things that maybe you're already doing or maybe you're doing in kind of a, a minimal way, um, but it just really kind of puts it down on paper that you have to do this. Sometimes they're even specific on how. So, for example, provision 11, it requires a general operating manual with certain uh, topics in it even. They, they say you have to have the manual and they say like 14 things that that manual has to have. Uh, so maybe your company has a policy document, but it maybe is very simple. So this gets you to kind of mature that. Uh, number 14, you have to conduct practical training. So part 107, you know, you can just go take a test, you get your license, you're good to go. There's no practical training, which I think a lot of people were thinking like that's crazy when this first came out but it's a very low barrier to entry now to do these advanced operations you actually have to prove that you can fly the aircraft in a safe way so you actually mm -hmm. have to go train and demonstrate that uh 15 requires a safety briefing a lot of companies probably do that already but it actually tells you again it has to cover these you know 10 things in it uh sms and data recording so there, there's just a lot of provisions that kind of take you to the next level, so to speak. So let's, and let's look at uh, like provisions 16 and 32. Um, yeah. It's one thing I left out in the explanation about how these daisy chain visual observers are set up. This provision number 16 and 32 are very, very important for that. So how do you maintain situational, a high level of situational awareness with visual contact of the aircraft and communicate that information back to the RPIC when it's beyond their line of sight? And that is with uh, what is required in these two, which is full duplex communication. So this is where there's no push to talk button. They can hear the VO can say directly to the RPIC exactly what is happening in real time without having to have a delay or push a button. And same thing for the RPIC, they can talk back and forth. So there's no opportunity to step over communications there because it's full duplex. So it's just a conversation. And that's really yeah. how you need to obtain that full situation awareness because you can't, you know, step on someone with the microphone and now you don't hear their transmission because they might say, Hey, there's an inbound aircraft and you, um, you know, they're describing how it's coming and the RPIC is going to make the decision on what they need to do, whether it's descend, hover, hold or whatever. Um, but this is a very, very important provision. Um, and it's something that, uh, you know, needs to be done to elevate these operations. So, um, yeah, it's kind of like, uh, just think of like a manned cockpit, right? You have your captain and your co-pilot sitting there. 
they don't push a button to talk to each other. They're just constantly talking, like having a natural mm-hmm. conversation. So that's that's what the FA is trying to get with this full duplex. Yeah. So no, and, you know, walkie talkies or anything like that. Go right. Get a cell and phone to, with a Bluetooth headset and. And not to be confused, in. like you know, like there is a push the talk button in the aircraft when you're transmitting yeah. to, let's say, a tower, right? But we're right. not. But it's more about crew communication and not communicating to a tower. So so don't get Correct. that confused either. Um, just because a man pilot does sometimes push a button to talk doesn't, this, that's not what we're describing here. We're talking the communication between the crew, which is right. really important. Yep. Good, good clarification. Yeah. Um, you want to hit off with, uh, some of the last provisions that we have here, uh, like the functional check flight. That's always a fun one. Yeah. Kind of an interesting one. And again, I, I think a lot of companies probably do this. Like you do some maintenance, you do a software update, maybe you, you know, damaged it. Oops. Uh, I think a lot of people naturally want to like make sure their drone works before they go on mission. So they probably do some little flight. Oh, yep. It it still works. Okay. Send Mm -hmm. it. This provision 24 actually requires that. So whenever you do maintenance, you actually have to do what they call a functional check flight to make sure the aircraft is still airworthy and and ready to actually go. So Mm -hmm. again, it's just defining things that a lot of companies probably already do. So. Right, right. You know, you're doing a flight flight check right before you do, you know, yaw left, yaw right, descend, you know, make a little box turn or something like that. These are just make yeah. sure your equipment's working right. Just the same thing like if you're sitting in a manned uh, aircraft before you take off, you're going to check your control surfaces to make sure yeah. that <laughs> when you push <laughs> the rudder pedals that the rudder goes the right way <laughs> or moves yeah. at all, right? I mean, so right. this, is, this is important. So it's so funny how... We got off really easy right away with 107 uh, certificate just to go out and operate. And there, we have high level of restrictions, but we have very low level of requirements in order to get access to the NAS. And now, as we do more advanced operations, we're creeping more and more towards the manned aviation and the true professional aviator that all these things now matter because you're increasing your risk, you're, se- you're sending the drones out farther. So they're really starting to act more like aircraft, manned aircraft at this point where you need to be so aware of everything around you because there's, you know, there's a person in the, in the airplane that you possibly could cross traffic with. And this is important for deconfliction now. So this is the level at which we need to operate is much, much higher. Yep. Yeah. And then I suppose we'll hit on kind of the last provisions here, at least for this discussion, 33 and 34. So provision 33 actually prohibits ADSB out probably going to be a point of contention with some people and you know there's pros and cons to it right adsb out can help situational awareness there's no doubt about that uh this doesn't prohibit adsb in by the way so you can still receive uh man traffic but it prohibits the uas from broadcasting uh they're actually looking at uh, an alternative called udsb that's a u as in unmanned uh so unmanned dependent surveillance broadcasts just said the word in it but <laughs> but it basically it's an alternative that it's like kind of an unmanned version of adsb where unmanned guys might talk to each other and maybe they would broadcast to manned in certain situations like higher altitudes or near airports but for right now the fa is just kind of holding back on that they just don't want to unleash you know all these uas <laughs> broadcasting so anyways long story short prohibits it so be careful of that the, the final one, 34, requires an FCC authorized transmitter. So equipment that has transmitters that don't have FCC IDs, mm-hmm. that is illegal. So <laughs> <laughs> it's illegal under Part 107, but it's it's like extra illegal under these waivers. They, they specifically call it out back in the day when we were operating a radio without an FCC ID under a waiver, and we got caught with our pants down, and the FA said, We'll never let that happen again. So make <laughs> sure your transmitter has an ID. <laughs> Just do it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, we've kind of run through all of the provisions for that excellent waiver. We're excited to see 107.31 getting on the board there <laughs> as well as 107.33. Uh, these are good to see. Um, if you guys are guys and gals are out there wanting to learn more about this, feel free to reach out to us through our website. We do have... Um, an advanced form to fill out for advanced uh, operations. We certainly will help you get towards this level. Again, it's not for the faint of heart because it is difficult and it is highly, 
has a lot of restrictions to what you need to be doing, but we have some knowledge to navigate those waters. Um, also, congratulations to the FAA for making a record setting 52 waivers in one week. This is amazing. We'll have to see <laughs> if they can hold their own next week with the shortened work week. I don't know how many FAA contractors took Thursday and Friday off, but certainly they were off on Thursday. And, you know, they might have had the, uh, is it is it tryptophan that's in a turkey? <laughs> yeah. The, they might have had the, the tryptophan the, hangover on Friday and not done much. Or they went yeah. Black Friday shopping and bought the DJI drones for yeah. I think it was like 400 and some bucks off some DJI products, like insane sales. So we don't want to give too big of a plug out to DJI, but <laughs> make sure you register those drones. Right? That's right. You register them at drone zone, right? <laughs> the drone zone. Yeah. Just Google drone zone. Take yourself yep. there. It's five bucks if you're a commercial or if you're just a recreational flyer. So five bucks for all of your aircraft. If you're a recreational flyer, there's one number. $5 for each aircraft if you're a commercial operator. Make sure you do that. That is commonly like an odd thing that a lot of people mess up on is like they register their aircraft, but then they don't put their number on. So make sure you do that. But until next week, we'll see you guys around. Fly safe. Yeah, and don't forget, we do have an audio and a video version of this. YouTube, podcasts, we're on Spotify. We're getting on Apple Podcasts as well. So check those out. We'll have links. All but right. like you said, take care until next week. <laughs> <laughs>